Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 457, featuring an interview with Bob Alberti. Now, if that name doesn't ring any bells for you, don't worry. That is why I wanted to have him on the show, because uh, in my opinion, he's uh, one of the unsung heroes, a, a pioneer that just really hasn't gotten the attention that he deserves. He's done a lot of really uh, groundbreaking stuff, uh, especially if you are a fan of uh, online role-playing games. Uh, so a little bit about him, we'll get into it in the video, but he's uh, best known for his work on Scepter of Goth, uh, the first commercial uh, online role-playing game. And he's also known for a internet protocol called Gopher, uh, which uh, you may remember if you ever used the uh, internet before the World Wide Web. It's a really cool sort of thing, back when it felt like you're kind of like a hacker. You know, if you're connecting to a network, it was a really cool time, and he's got a lot of, uh, you know, an insider's perspective on the whole thing. So it's really cool. And then if that's not enough, he's also uh, done some work with a uh, professor M. A. R. Barker and the Tecumel uh, RPG system. Uh, just really cool stuff. There's just so much here. <laughs> Let's just get on with it. Uh, anyway, uh, without further ado, here is Mr. Bob Alberti. Folks, I am here today with the great Bob Alberti. He is a information security architect and insult comedian. He's also one of the people responsible for some of the biggest uh, breakthroughs in terms of online, uh, just <laughs> the internet as we know it today. He's one of the pioneers. Uh, he did Scepter of Goth, which was the first ever commercial uh role-playing game, commercially online role-playing game. We're definitely going to get into that. But he also uh, worked on a project called Gopher, uh, which is one of the great pioneering systems. If you, Some of you might have uh, played around with it. I know I did back in the, in the 90s. So we got a lot to cover here. And if that's not enough for you, <laughs> uh, he's also done his own uh, role-playing game books. And uh, we were just talking about a, uh, one he wrote about Mitlin Y'all, not sure I'm pronouncing that right, is it? <laughs> Somewhere in the, uh, the Tecumel, Tecumel system. Just Tecumel. Tecumel. Uh, that's an interesting yep. system. You know, I hope we, we definitely want to have some time to, to get into that, too. It's very mm -hmm. interesting. So we got something here, for, I think, for everybody. If you like computing history, if you like game history, if you like tabletop <laughs> role-playing games, <laughs> Bob's the man. So thank you so much for joining me today, Bob. How, how are you? I'm just fine. How are you? Doing good. Uh, why don't we just start with this? I know you got an event coming up. Mm -hmm. in, it's called Vilification Tennis. That's right. Vilification uh, Tennis. <laughs> okay. uh, can insult, you tell us what this is? We're an insult comedy troupe that began at the Renaissance, the Minnesota Renaissance Festival more than 30 years ago. And um, we've recently left the Minnesota Renaissance Festival and we perform in uh, uh, performance spaces until covid and now we perform online. Um, so you can watch us uh, for free by just going to vilificationtennis.com. Um, and I'm sure that's easy to just spell out. I won't need to spell it out for you. Everyone knows how to spell that. Um, and what we do is we insult each other for your entertainment. And you, you get to watch. We do not insult innocent persons. We insult oh, each other. Yeah, I was wondering, the, the tennis metaphor, is it kind of a it's, like it's, back and forth? We have a judge, and the judge scores points when the uh, when the insults are particularly good. <laughs> sounds really fun. It's also very blue, so uh, make sure that you know the kids aren't listening. Oh, so it's rated R humor. Yes. Um, I had a couple of questions actually. Some people had had about this. I'll do the fun one first. This is from uh, well, they're both fun, but. <laughs> <laughs> this one's kind of a I don't know, I didn't mean to just ask the question. This is Matt Shurgy. He says, uh, I would like to insult my mother in law. How do I do it? Um carefully and from a distance. 
Um, you know, the, the, the best way to insult mother-in-laws is uh, simply to give them grandchildren and <laughs> hand them over and say, here you go, change those kids. I, I don't want to get somebody into trouble, so short of that, I don't want to give too much advice. Yeah, I remember reading a book one time called Shakespeare's Insults or something like that. And This is kind of, of what that's based on as it came from the Renaissance Festival. It initially began with very Renaissance-era style insults and then has sort of morphed over time into more contemporary information. Well, there really is an, an art to it. You know, I think mm -hmm. I like to watch Black Adder and shows or Monty Python. You know, there's a lot of really witty laugh out loud insults. Yep. You know, you wish, you know, I wouldn't mind being insulted. Well, <laughs> I feel like it was really I, I clever can, and creative. I, you know? I can, I can give you an insult. It's like, uh, I don't like you, Matt. And the reason I don't like you is because you remind me of math and I hate math. All right. You're a square. Your friends are imaginary. Your jokes are derivative. And can he make them funny? Of course he can't. <laughs> oh, you're so in my... the world of ge geometrical humor, math. Love it. I got a question here from Alan. Now, Bob, I don't know if you've played this game, Bob, but there's a Probably. game. There's a game called The Secret of Monkey Island. I have not played The Secret of Monkey Island. Okay, so we'll give you that for homework. <laughs> a, the reason this game comes up is there's a section in there. Everybody that's played the game loves this. It sounds a little bit like vilification tennis, to be honest. Uh, there's this gameplay sequence where you're coming up with insults, and then you have this insult sword fighting, they call it. So mm -hmm. instead of yep. the sword fight, you have insults going back and forth. Uh, but Alan's question more generally is, is there a video game that gets insults right from your perspective? I don't have enough experience of video games to tell you. I certainly don't have one that jumps to mind as, as a premier insult video game candidate. Um, you're right, though. The history of, of insult battles goes back to doing the dozens. You know, the, uh, yeah, I've heard about their that. Their practice of, of insulting each other on the street corners. So it's a, it's a long, long-standing art form that I'm preserving, not me and my colleagues. I was thinking about, I know you've done some... Uh played some of those old Zork Infocom mm -hmm. adventure games. I'm trying to remember. I, I seem to remember being, I guess, gently ridiculed by that parser. <laughs> I typed in something really, <laughs> really dumb. I don't recall that. Uh, well, let's get into uh, to Scepter then. Mm -hmm. uh, Scepter of Goth. This is, you know, I don't, I've written some books about the history of role playing or computer role playing games, and of course this game comes up. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually, a lot of the focus when you're talking about this era is on uh, uh, muds. Yeah. So it's really like I wanted to know more about this other thing, you know, this the scepter of God sure. and, and milieu and all this. Uh, just a little bit of background that from your uh, the chapter that, or the book article. What are we calling it? The script document. <laughs> I'll post a link to it, folks, because it's really great reading if you want to read about about this. Uh, but anyway, he, uh, uh, Scepter of Goth was the primary offering of game bit multi systems. That was Alan Clyde Scurry. Is it Gary or Jerry? Jerry. Jerry Leon, Robert Albert, yep, C uh, Senior. Is that your yep. dad? That was my dad. And of course, Bob here in 1983. So pretty right. early stuff. And it was actually based on an earlier game than that, a non-commercial MMORPG called uh, Milieu, created by Cl uh, Kleitz in 1978. So this is like really early, early stuff. So I was just wondering if you kind of flesh out the story for us, Bob. Sure. Um, there's a great show on that uh, you can catch for free. It's on uh, tpt.org slash solid state. And it's about the history of computers in Minnesota. And uh, the reason I mention that is because it'll give you a a good background on, on why this was was the case. But in the mid 70s, there was a mainframe computer uh, set up for all high schools in the state of Minnesota to dial into. So all students, it wasn't just like a grading system. It was a it was a mainframe for all students to be able to dial in and connect. And that was in place as early as 76, possibly earlier. Um, as soon as you get a bunch of high school students on a system where they can do a who command and see each other, they're going to start trying to connect. And that's what they did. And my friend, uh, 
uh, Stephen Collins wrote the first chat program on there, Captain Collins Talk. And then now people are able to talk to each other. And in that environment, Alan uh, Cleats went and wrote Milieu, uh, which went through a number of different names, including Empire and such. Um, but his accomplishments with Milieu were uh, rather astounding because he was doing things that were not done professionally and systematically for at least another 10 years. Uh, he was trying to run this fantasy game on a very, very small system. Think about how much less powerful a mainframe system must have been back in the late 70s. Um, and he had limited memory. And so he started doing memory paging. And there was no memory paging prior to that. He, he had to create it for his, uh, for his application. He, was all, he also found stores of memory in the drive caches that would read data off the hard drive and then write it onto the hard drive and it would sit idle for most of its time and so he started writing memory out to the drive caches and back and he was doing all this without the awareness of the people running the computer uh the people at mech uh were gobsmacked when they discovered the extent to which his application had had sort of infiltrated the rest of the computer system um and uh, yeah, so he wrote this game. Uh, it, it blew everyone away. I mean, it's it's 1977, 1978, and you can type, you know, look at dragon. It says the dragon roars at you, and then it says Fred attacks the dragon, and you say Fred, do not attack the dragon, and then it says the dragon roasts Fred, and you can pick up Fred's stuff and walk away. <laughs> I mean, all of this was possible back then, wow. and it was yeah, it it was amazing. Um, and so that went on until about 83. And then what happened in 83 was that Apple Computer went to uh, Mech, which was the company that ran this mainframe, and said, you know, mainframes, they're so yesterday. Why don't you get rid of those and put instead Apple II computers in all the high schools throughout Minnesota? And so the state legislature said, that sounds like a great idea to us because we don't know anything. And they did that. <laughs> they got rid of Mech. Yeah. And they put Apple IIs in the in the classrooms, and that's why 10, 15 years later, you could still find Apple IIs up on the shelves gathering dust in classrooms because Apple had made a big score of selling uh, computers to all these all these schools. Um, and when that happened, I knew about the community that was on Mech. I mean, we are still a community. The 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 people of that generation still rub rub elbows as we move around the Twin Cities uh, technology uh, market, you know, we still see each other and, and, and interact. And um, I knew people would pay to maintain that community. And so that was where the idea for Gamebit came from. Um, I, I just figured, you know, let's find a way to put something up so that people can email, chat, and play games again. And, of course, as soon as I thought playing games, I thought it must be Alan Cleats we, we get for this. And so I reached out to him and he, uh, you know, he was invaluable. He wrote pretty much everything soup to nuts on the QNX operating system. Um, he wrote our, our, you know, our, our chat room, our, our main menu interface, um, the email system, the whole nine yards, and as well as writing, you know, as well as writing uh, uh, Scepter of Goth. This guy sounds like some kind of real life hackers. Um, <laughs> Super genius. A mad scientist type. Yeah. Alan was was very clearly uh, extraordinarily gifted in, in in the computing area. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of curious about you know you talked about this in, in your book a, a little bit too, and some of the other articles about why was all this happening in Minnesota, right? You know, of all places, and you know, I'm sort of I'm I'm near Minnesota in the in the context of being near the Mississippi River. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I've never lived too far from that river. <laughs> Uh, but I was surprised when I got up here and I started to research all this computer history stuff. And it's like, Minnesota yep. keeps coming. I'm there in Minnesota and doing this and this. Uh, so what was, uh, you know, why, we talked about this a little bit, the MECC, M -E -C -C, M -E -C -C, Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium. Right. Uh, so maybe just a little bit about that. Sure. Um, well, I'll refer you again to that great uh, hour-long documentary on tpt.org slash solid state. Um, it is a very detailed look at the computing history in Minnesota. But in short, uh, coming off of World War II, um, Minnesota became Silicon Valley before there was a Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, Minnesota had 3M, Univac, Honeywell, IBM, 
um, uh, Rand, uh, a number of other organizations that are that are gone now, uh, uh, Control Data, mm-hmm. etc. Uh, we just had them here um, as a result of World War II and these other elements. And, and, and engineers coming back from World War II needed jobs, and there was plenty of uh, stuff that needed doing. Um, and so we just happened to be gifted with, with this powerful culture of, of technology and, and computer engineering. And so um, that went along uh, in Minnesota until the, until the 70s and 80s. And then, of course, what happened was a lot of these companies became so successful, they moved out to California uh, because it's freezing cold here. And so why would you want to live here if you didn't have to? Um, and that's, you know, that that's in, in large yeah. part what happened was just uh, the World War II uh, repercussions of having all these engineers and this this highly educated workforce up here building computers. Um, it's well worth watching that documentary, but that's where that comes from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the games we... <clears throat> I've covered a few times, you talked about for sure, and I bet some of the audience will have played uh, the Oregon Trail. Mm-hmm. You know, that's one of the, I remember seeing that mech on the bottom of that and thinking, hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that, that was kind of their signature product, and, and you can find it to play online now. I mean, it's, oh, it's running yeah. on an emulator on some web page someplace, and you can play it. I'm pretty sure it's been mentioned on Big Bang Theory, Theory a few times, that joke yep. about the dysentery. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also uh, some of the other earlier stuff too. The was uh, Hunt the Wumpus came up in your yep your book. That's a really well, that, that was nineteen seventy two. Yeah, it was, it was, was the year that you mentioned yep. there. So that, I guess that's about six years before. It was very interesting to kind of do the the work to uh, sort of report on sort of the development of the games uh, on computers over the fifties and sixties. Um, you know, one of the earliest games that I mentioned in there is. Um, uh, a, a, like a, a a stock game or a financial game. Yeah, it sounded right. incredibly boring, but they were very fascinated with it. Um, and then you've got you know, Hunt the Wumpus. You've got uh, Advent. Um, oh, if you remember one. that that's game? Great. Yep, that's a that is a great one. Colossal, it's or the game before uh, Zork and Yep, Will Crowther and Don Woods, I believe, is the. Yep, it's very interesting to go back and play that on emulators now because it remains extremely challenging. Oh, pretty massive too. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, I think that game also was. Uh, I remember um, Richard Bartle talking about that game as well. Yep. As uh, one of the inspirations for uh, the, the mud. Mm-hmm. It sounds like it was also one of the inspirations from Mil- Milieu. Right, Milieu and Scepter of Goth and uh, Professor Bartle's uh, mud all drew off those same sources, although they were parallel developed. You know, we were not in touch with Bartle or anything like that at the time. Um, had no awareness yeah, of that. He was over in the UK somewhere during all this. Yeah. I don't know. <clears throat> yep. Sort of parallel streams, I suppose. It was. It was very much parallel development. Is that Foreign Intrigue? Is that the game here? Yes. That was our <laughs> rip of Diplomacy. Um, we had a lot of people who liked playing Diplomacy, and so uh, we wrote our own map, which was different from the Diplomacy map, called it Foreign Intrigue, and allowed people to play through email. And it was actually a lot of fun. So let's, one of the things I noticed, uh, kind of a theme, building on some of these uh, articles, was this, you know, you're wanting to do commercial development with Scepter mm-hmm. of Goth, and you're running into people that just, like a culture clash, people that well, saw that as a sinister or something. We, we know, what's, ran into what's that, going on with that? We ran into that both with Scepter of Goth and with Internet Gopher. Um, you know, back, it, it's, it's kind of like if you have an actual settler culture, if you're actually like out in the woods clearing land and, you know, building a settlement, everybody works together and nobody really worries about whose is what or what's going on, you know, until you've got your basic foundations of, of the town established. And then people will get pretty pretty clear about where their boundaries are and, and you know you'll set up a mercantile and people start selling mm-hmm. something um, but when you're in that initial state of just trying to get anything to work at all um, that's when you get this this uh, camaraderie this this culture of just let's let's all build it together and that was certainly the case back in uh, the early 80s and it was certainly the case with internet gopher that the internet was still building itself 
And so people would write software and, and then they would put it out on the internet and tell other people to add to it. And other people would look at it and they'd say, oh yeah, I know, fix this, change this. Here, I put these changes in. Um, and everybody just worked on stuff collaboratively. So when you then step up and you say, okay, now I'm gonna start trying to make money off this, there's this sort of sense of ownership that people feel is being violated. They're like, how come you are making money off this? We're, we're working hard to make this code better and, and you're gonna make money off it. Um, so it's a legitimate cultural question. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, at some point, it does become a commercial venture. And as you can see, it's becoming an enormous commercial venture, the internet. Um, so somebody had to be first and I was just crass enough to be that person, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, would, uh, I, I never had any problem with it. I was kind of toying with a hypothesis earlier this morning about maybe the fact that so much of this was based in universities mm -hmm. and these were professors who, I guess, you know, I don't, like at St. Cloud State, were not allowed to have another job. Right. You know, outside of uh, being a professor. So I wonder if there was some of that. If my, some some sort of element like that might have been in play here, like well, if once it becomes a job, then this I might get into some trouble with the, you know, with the, with the uh, administration or something. I, I haven't quite developed my hypothesis out yet, hmm. but <laughs> I just wonder well, if there's something there. Certainly, when you start charging money for things, a lot more is expected of you. You know, if you if you just offer something for free and it crashes every two hours, well, it's free. But if you, you get what start, you pay for, if you start charging money for something, it better not crash every two hours. In fact, it better not crash at all. Um, and so the standards for going commercial are, you know, they're considerably higher. And you better meet those standards or you won't make any money. Well, let's talk a little bit more about Scepter of Roth mm -hmm. and this transition. You know, we talked about the transitions from the mainframes to the Apple IIs. And yeah, I was kind of interested in the model, this franchise model. So mm -hmm. I guess the idea was the different cities would have their own franchise. Right. And, you know, this was before the idea of computers communicating with each other over those long distances was terribly common. Um, at the time, you had FidoNet and you had the beginnings of CitadelNet on the BBS side. You know, they'd call each other up. They'd exchange packets of messages. And certainly it was our thought to go in that direction. But at that time, we did not know about the, the growth of the Internet and we did not sort of foresee that, that that would be a way to tie a bunch of uh, systems together. You know, from our point of view, um, we had been pretty much run out of the Twin Cities local market where we'd started, and the only way to survive that we could think of was to franchise our software to other cities, um, which ended up working out very well for us. But, uh, um, you know, that was about as much strategic thought had, as had been given to it at that point. So I wonder if you could tell me just a little bit more about Scepter of Goth and what it was like to, to play this game and the setting of Bold Home. Yeah, when we when I when I went to put together the the game database, you know, Alan was the person writing the code. It's kind of like uh, Richard Bartle described in his his in his uh, interview. He said he was kind of the guy who did the database while Trubshaw did the code. And he could do code as well, but they each had their preferences. And it was similar for me and Alan. Alan was extraordinarily gifted with code, not so much with documentation of code, but with the code itself. Um, and I was content to be writing the database by and large because uh, trying to figure out Alan's code was, was confounding. Um, so I ended up writing the database. I had done something similar before. Um, I had taken the Advent uh, game engine and I had rewritten the database underneath it to be a Lord of the Rings setting. Uh, I had done this for a, uh, a class project. And, you know, it was it was such that, you know, you could say X, Y, Z, Z, Y in one of the Lord of the Rings rooms, and it would still pop you over to another of the Lord of the Rings rooms because I just relabeled everything. Um, and that was built into the game engine. But having had that experience, I was able to uh, to carry that into writing the, the database for Bold Home and Scepter. Um, the 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 world basically had three scales. Uh, you had the town of Boldholm that was built on uh, sort of a, a block by block scale, and then is when you exited Boldholm, you'd be in the countryside. And the country countryside, each block of space in the countryside was as big as Boldholm itself, so that you were in a sort of a hex by hex scale at that point. Um, and then those those topographical elements served to tie together the separate adventures. 
and each of the separate adventures would be linked into that map and would have its own scale, but a much smaller scale even than Bold Homes. Um, so we wrote on those three scales. Uh, we had a number of conventions. Um, we used kind of the advent-based um, hashtag short, hashtag long uh, uh, descriptors. Um, in, in, in Advent, if you look around, if, if you walk into a room, it gives you a full description. Mm -hmm. And then when you say, you know, where am I? It says you're in this room, which is the short description. And those are separated by hashtags um, or what we called pound signs back then. Um, and that's how we wrote the, the descriptors for, uh, for Scepter as well. So you'd, you'd walk into a room, you'd get a full description. When you looked around again, you'd get a short description. Um, and yeah, it was a town. It had the town square. It had your usual sort of D&D-esque features such as a pub, a cleric's guild, a mage's guild, guilds for each of the different character classes. Um, it had uh, a, a, a seamy part of the, sound, of the town down towards the docks. It had a high-class part of the town up in the north. Um, it had a middle-class part of the town you know, elsewhere. And you would encounter various creatures and things based on sort of those settings. And then there were several ways out of the town, including crawling through the sewer and going out either of the gates um, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, like you would encounter in most muds. Um, you know, you could walk down the street, you'd encounter, you'd encounter something. Uh, you might know it was a, a person or you might not know it was a person. You might think it was, uh, a, a town guard. Um, it might be an automatic, it might be a bot or it might be a person you wouldn't know necessarily. Um, and then you could interact with them. You could talk with them. You could fight with them. Um, you could give them things, steal things from them follow them, um, a, a number of different things you could do there. It sounds like a lot of fun to me. Uh, one of the things I was intrigued by was some of the problems, I guess, with Milieu and with this that you ran into early on and some of the really clever, I thought, ways to deal with some of these these issues that come up again and again in these MMO spaces, right? The, namely the player killing mm -hmm. uh, being one and the uh, the gold inflation is that the mm -hmm. one I'm looking for uh, being another? So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the solutions you came up with for those problems. Well, I mean, uh, Alan had experienced in uh, milieu back in the 70s that, um, you know, the, the economics of uh, a mud such as this were completely unsupportable. Um, you have uh, objects appearing out of thin air. And it's very hard to maintain value for a particular type of object when you can generate 20 of them just by killing 20 kobolds. Um, and so he encountered that there was rampant inflation because, you know, everything was everything was was falling out, out of the out of the, out of the air, including money itself. Um, and so his solution for that was to simply destroy the world and start over as part of the storyline. And um, that was a, a game, a, a game concept that was continued into Scepter of Goth. Um, the idea in Scepter was that this had already happened once and that the world was recovering from the last time it had happened. Um, and should should we have survived as a game and a company long enough, eventually when our mechanics got out of whack, when our when our uh, finances got out of whack, we had an entire end game similar to the end game that Alan had run. Um, that would, you know, reset the world and reset everything and knock everything back down to zero. Um, it's interesting to note too that when Alan ran his uh, his endgame sequence in the '70s, uh, he did that manually by hand and for an audience of, of of players, and so that was pretty much the like the first online performance um, that you can really point to and say. Here was someone putting on a, a theatrical presentation online for somebody. Um, it's an interesting way to look at it, but somebody pointed that out to me, and I, I've thought about it since then. It's very interesting. It kind of circles back to your Renaissance Festival. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> We're right. This idea right. of the performance. Uh, so this, uh, I'm kind of intrigued by this idea of these, uh, I guess, great catastrophes that would happen from mm -hmm. time to time. and. You know, I know sometimes you hear about these massive MMOs these days with their level squish, I think is what they're calling them. It's going to happen to, uh, to WoW soon. But, you know, I suppose there would be some 
angry players too. Like, oh my god, I saved up all this money and yeah, all these we, items. I mean, how do you placate them? We we had a couple of uh, players um, that it was good that we placated them. Uh, one fellow spent enormous amounts of money, um, and so he would he would call me at home. How he got my home number, I don't know. Um, and at three in the morning and he'd say, your dragon just killed my barbarian. And that wasn't fair. It used some kind of cheat. <laughs> he called you on the phone with this. <laughs> yeah. I would say, you know, oh, so I get up at three in the morning and I sit there and restore his character, uh, bleary eyed, um, because that's what he was demanding and he was a big customer. And so what the heck? Um, and, uh, that guy, it turned out years later, was uh, convicted in civil court of, of murdering his uh, competitor in a, in, a, in a business in the Twin Cities. Um, so I was really glad that I, uh, I fixed his computer character. <laughs> at it's kind of funny, but also kind of scary, too. I mean, my kind of scary yeah, about kind of... these people. This is like the nightmare that everybody has about mm -hmm. that random mm -hmm. person from the Internet. Yep, yep. And, and he was only ever convicted in civil court. They never were able to prove anything in criminal court. So he's still out there walking around. So, you know, you got to be careful with them, some people. Yeah, no kidding. You know, speaking of, I guess, sort of sociopathic behavior, uh, the player killing, mm -hmm. you know, in the game was, I thought, pretty clever. I remember, I remember reading about uh, Ultima Online and the way Gary handled this through the, the player bounties and all this. But yep. it sounds like you kind of had a, earlier take on that with the assassins guild mm -hmm. yep so assassins could kill player characters without a penalty to themselves um so with the, that, so ordinarily so, you could kill another player but then you would get some kind of a penalty for that well the guards in town would start chasing you around uh you would you basically annoy the game and the game itself would do its best to kill you plus other people could then kill you without a penalty too so if you became a a killer um, you had to be very careful because, yeah, the guards were out to get you. Uh, any monster that was not normally aggravated by a human coming into their space would be aggravated by you. Um, so it made the game much harder for the player. Um, that was that was one of the character classes that we introduced um, in order to like sort of fix a problem. The other one that we introduced was the princess character class. Hmm. And that's because, as, as Bartle points out, only like 5% of players have been female, you know, actually female. Um, and um, uh, so in an effort to try to draw in more female customers, you know, players who were actually female were allowed to play this princess character class, which was basically a kind of a blend between a, uh, a magic user and a cleric uh, with some warrior skills thrown in. It was definitely an advantaged class. Um, and it was just basically a, a, a way to try to draw in female uh, customers. Did it work out well? You know, I'm kind of wondering, like, how did you know? Well, I mean, we we knew all our customers. We had a you know a, a, a database of names. Um, I actually found a copy of it once. Um, you know, so we knew our customers, and you know, most of their names are, are gendered enough that we could tell we had at least a few female characters. But the numbers were you know always extraordinarily low. Um, so I don't know that it worked out all that well, but uh, that was our attempt at least. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, I was thinking. The, the, the Assassin's yeah. class required an extra fee to be that class, right? So there was some premium, well, we had, premium options, yeah. I guess, for players that wanted to. We had premium options. We also had characters who were associate DMs. Um, and this, so this played into our next game. Uh, after Gambit, we started writing a game, uh, a, a game um, called Screenplay, and it was on a system called Unison that we were building um, before basically that financial side of things just completely collapsed. Um, but uh, Screenplay was going to have um, containers and much more intelligent bots, and um, that would allow a lot more dynamism in, in how the game was played. Uh, there were things we couldn't do in Scepter that we, we wanted to do in, 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 in screenplay. Um, and they were, that was fun. I mean, screenplay had things like, um, you know, you could put triggers on doors to have actions happen. Uh, you could put triggers in any objects based on a string so that 
saying something or doing something around an object would cause the object to react. So if you said, look in the mirror, it would tell you the mirror reflects back your face, um, that kind of thing. Um, so that was that was a game that got about 80% written before stuff fell apart um, and doesn't get into the history books very much, but it had a lot of really advanced characteristics that I didn't see for 20 years in online games. I was reading about that. It would let you create scripts and programs within the game. Yeah. And so what the assistant... That's pretty advanced stuff. What the assistant DM idea was that was taking over to to screenplay was the idea that assistant DMs could create the game. Um, They could create rooms. They could punish characters. They could move characters around. Um, And the idea was to encourage our customers, while not they would be free access while they're doing this, Uh, to create uh, adventure space themselves. And in screenplay, everybody could do that. Depending on what it was you had the rights to do, there were basically an increasing set of rights as you became a more powerful character so that you could start by creating objects and then creating scripted objects. Um, And the, the idea was to encourage people as they became wizards in the world, they would move from wizards into being assistant DMs almost transparently mm-hmm. um, and again that never quite came through but that was the goal this sounds uh, exactly like user generated content and like the yeah, whole yeah. modding community of today yep. this this sounds exactly like that that's that's exactly what we were after and it's because i'm incredibly lazy and i didn't want to <laughs> all the space, you know no i mean our, our our users had brilliant ideas you know they 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 could write things very well as well it's just um, you know, when you're running a commercial company, you can't necessarily let somebody start messing around with your IP if you're not very careful about how you accomplish it. So, you know, that was what we were trying to do. Yeah, Bob, I don't know how much you want to get in, into that, you know, part of the story, but, you know, the people might be wondering, well, what happened to this game, you know? Well, you know, <laughs> Yeah, we, some unfortunate su- hires, sounds like, and some... We, we just suffered from... Wells. As- as many curses as could be flung Murphy, at our Murphy's mind. law. Murphy's law took over. Um, the the first problem was that we hired a programmer who immediately copied our software and then used our own chat room to try to sell it. Um, and because he was using our own chat room to try to sell it, we caught him. Um, not the, and not the most clever marketing. No. Well, on the other hand, there weren't other chat rooms he could use in the world, so. You know, there were, but he wasn't that smart. So uh, he took our software and set up a competing company in the local Twin Cities market and charged, uh, a, a, you know, a, a $10 a month flat fee or something like that for its use. And all that did was just kick our customers out from under us. They all jumped over to the other side where it was much cheaper, granted. How much um, but cheaper it was, also- was it, by the way? Well, we were $3 an hour. We were expensive. $3 an hour versus $10 an hour. It, it versus ten dollars a month. Yeah, we were we were not cheap, um, and that was deliberate because we you know we were trying to support ourselves on this, um, which we never quite did, but we we did okay. Um, but I always had another job on the side. I always had to have something to pay the bills. Um, so anyway, he yeah he ran this local company, and that was when we franchised because we weren't making any money in the Twin Cities anymore. Uh, so we franchised to these other cities. That worked out really well. Um, then we sold our company to one of our franchisees um, in Washington D.C. and and partnered up with them. We you know we in, sold it for in, a Interplay. Shipper. Was that Interplay? Interplay, yeah, but not not yeah. the Interplay, but not the Interplay we know of, but the yeah. one that existed it. Um, and unfortunately, that guy was a crook. Um, after we had the company set up and we were working on building Unison and things like that. Uh, the IRS came in and arrested him on 18 counts of tax evasion and seized all his assets, which included our computers. Uh, so that was it for for Gamebit slash Interplay at that point, um, which was you know a very discouraging time. Um, but uh, you know, you learn your lessons. That's a sad ending to a yeah. About 1987. Was, I mean, that's what I mean. This was four years. You know, we had our software IP stolen, and we had competitors in town, and we had this guy by us, and we had this this guy go to jail, all in four years. <laughs> it's like, yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, world. 
So. Well, maybe to lighten the mood a little bit here, Bob. Yeah. You know, one of the parts of this book you wrote, there's a, you actually include the interview questions that you would ask mm -hmm. a aspiring DM. So I thought it'd be fun just to ask you some of these questions and see what. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> like, how would you respond to these? Uh, so the first one is, explain briefly what you believe is the function of a DM in a fantasy role-playing system. What should or shouldn't he do? Well, um, the DM is the servant leader. Uh, the DM is the person who uh, creates the world and makes sure that the game experience is immersive and satisfying for the players, but they do not use their own power to entertain themselves or to alter things outside the scope of the game. Sounds good. You get answers of that caliber often when you're, <laughs> when not, you're on the other true. side of this. <laughs> it was very interesting to test people and, and get the answers back. Yeah. What's funny, though, is that the people who passed, um, you know, this was a test that I wrote based on my own subjective feelings about things. And so it makes sense that the people who passed have ended up being good friends of mine ever since. You know, my friend uh, Keith DeLoon, um is, that's how I met him was through this this process, and we've been buddies ever since because we see the world the same way, and that's that's what's behind that. I imagine you were looking for people that would say something like, "Well, the job is to kill the players or to, well, right. <laughs> to make life yeah, miserable." <laughs> we had we had answers from people that it was like, "Well, if I did that, I'd just kill both players and let yeah. them start up new characters." It was like, "Oh yeah, yeah." Some of these questions are like or, hypotheticals. Right. And, and, and I'm like, you understand these people are paying for access. You can't just kill them and tell them to start over. They're not going to like that, you know. Um, so, yeah, there were people who did not become DMs because their answers were were not sufficiently understanding of the scenario. Yeah, some of these are quite detailed. Let me just do the second question, then maybe we'll do one of these right. detailed ones just for fun. Uh, but I think the second question here, this is something I think I thought about this a lot as I was writing this computer role-playing game history book. And, you know, I think it's a, it's a really, it's like the question okay. <laughs> to me. Uh, so explain what might be the differences between the DM of a standard FRP, fantasy role-playing game, and a Scepter DM, taking into consideration that the, the fee that player, uh, players pay, taking into consideration the fee that players pay and the fact that there is a rarely face-to-face -face contact. So this seems yep. like a very important question for anybody thinking about a computer role-playing game. So, Yep. Well, I mean, yeah, um, people coming to Scepter would not necessarily have had any past experience with MUDs. Um, they might have been milieu users, so they might have had some experience, but this might be the first time that someone trying to become an associate DM would really have, have moved from tabletop dice eye contact role playing into this realm where you're separated through the internet and we all know how the internet tends to amplify certain aspects of a person's character uh, sometimes not for the best and so this was kind of getting at that it's like you know how different will it be to be a dm uh in a commercial setting when you don't know the people personally it might be really easy to become very autocratic and very domineering and out of control. And so I wanted people who were, who were thoughtful enough to realize that, you know, this was going to be a different, uh, a different kind of DMing than face to face DMing. Okay. Let's do one of just one of the, the, uh, one of these hypotheticals. Okay. Uh, so player AAA plays Scepter a lot and frequently makes requests to the DMs for restoration of his character. Always with a good reason. I'm just trying to imagine what I would, you know, being on the other side of the table getting this question. Mm -hmm. uh, so player A frequently requests DM's help w with a good reason. Player B plays less heavily, but regularly, regularly, and has never requested restoration when killed. A is fighting a monster called an arachnid when B arrives and accidentally kills the already wounded A, player A, by typing thrust A. The same, uh, I guess, the idea is it's confused with the monster, Arachnid. 
Right. Uh, B runs from the room, erasing A's items, and A, at half his original level, finds and kills B, taking his items. Uh, player A requests his original level and items back. B requests his original level and items back. What do you do? So I can see how in that question, you're, you're, I, I, let me get my, my take on why you would ask this. <laughs> you're trying to get into, like, at the end, figure out how much this person actually knows about uh, the online space. And they would be able to parse all this, and then, and, and then also yeah. an ethical, right? Judgment. You know, you've got, you've got this, you've got this balance between the commercial realities of the game. Uh, under such a circumstance, you certainly don't want AAA to leave dissatisfied because they're an important customer. Yeah. Uh, B is also an important customer. Doesn't spend as much, but needs to be treated with respect. Um, but there's definitely that balance in there. And then, you know, what element of this is uh, a problem of the game, right? Uh, the game was not smart enough to say, by A, do you mean target one or target two, right? right? So there's right. an element to which they could say it was the game's fault. Um, I meant to hit the arachnid. I meant to hit the arachnid. I ended up accidentally killing triple A. Um, you know, what do you do in that situation? Um, there isn't a right answer. You know, the the real question for me was how thoughtfully uh, people arrived at what they did decide to do. Um, you know, many times it was it was restore both characters to their original state um, and just pretend the whole thing never happened, which is a perfectly acceptable answer. Um, it was a, it was a cluster, and uh, you know maybe we just go okay, let's let's just back that off and we'll resume from where we left off. That's really fascinating. It almost sounds like coming up with a constitution. <laughs> yeah, <that's a> good point. <laughs> like being a, some type of governor. Yep. And that's working a good... out laws for the uh, the magistrates. Yep. So I have a few questions again from Matt and Alan about this. I thought this was good. This is Matt Shergy. Have you gone back to play Scepter of Goth recently? Do you have any new thoughts on it from a modern context? I wish I could. Um the fact is that a copy of Scepter of Goth was running on the internet someplace as late as about 2009. And I actually went in there and walked around a little bit. Um, and then when I identified myself, uh, they lost their minds and took the system down. And I'm what? like, no, I, I, I don't want, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with you having this up, but they were afraid I was going to sue them or something. You know, and it's like, guys, no, nobody cares anymore. Just, I liked looking around here. Um, and so that was the last time I saw one that was online that you could run. So I haven't run it in ages. Um, we don't have a copy that can work. Uh, it was written for the QNX operating system on an IBM PCXT uh, with a Hostess card. And I still have the Hostess card, but I don't have a PCXT and I don't have a QNX operating system. So um, There's somebody in the audience that could probably help you out with that. Very possibly, I, you know, there are a bunch of, because backing up a little bit, when the guy stole the copy of our software locally, he not only stole a copy of our software and set up another company, he also handed copies to a few local people. Um, and some of those people who got copies of our software have gotten together on Facebook and talked about putting up their copy and trying to make it run again. Uh, again, they're all worried like I'm going to sue them. I don't care anymore. Um, but it might be possible that one of them will get something up and running at some point uh, so people can see what Scepter of Goth looked like. That sounds like you no longer have, or maybe never did have that hard of feelings about it. Or... Oh, no, I had terribly hard at feelings. The time, at the time. But... Yeah, um, 1987 was one of the worst years of my life. Um, but, uh, you know, you... Uh, Time goes on, and, and I mean, it's not like I could do anything with Scepter now except display it as a, as a museum piece. Oh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be happy to have a copy of Scepter running someplace just so people could see what it was. So Shrigi's got another question about it. Do you think graphics take away from RPG gaming? Well, I mean, you know, the, uh, a, a, the, the picture tells a thousand words, right? Um the power that text gives you is that you're using the graphic engine in the human brain to draw the pictures. So if I say, you know, you're in a dank cell with a tiger chained to the wall, 
I haven't had to draw any of that, but you know what it looks like. Um, so does it take away? I think attempting to build a visual representation consumes enormous resources and that maybe less time and attention are given to the gameplay itself and its balance and structure because we're busy trying to duplicate what our brains can do when a, there's a, ch a tiger chained to the wall in a cell. Um, so well, I, I don't think it takes away. I just think it makes it significantly different and it's extremely challenging because we all know mm -hmm. how picky the human eye is about visual representations that do and don't work. I mean, all you have to do is have a clipping error and, you know, somebody's head is stuck through a wall and you're like, yeah, that's kind of taken me out of the game for a minute there. <laughs> so. Yeah, I was thinking too, I've, I've had a few people on that talked about the, uh, uh, the voice acting and working with, with that and how it, it basically you're locked in in a way that you weren't before when you could just easily right. go back in and just change a line of dialogue. Well, it's, it's kind of the power responsibility curve. You know, it's like the more power that you take into yourself as a game producer to dictate how the game works, the more responsibility that you take on to make sure the game works well. So if you go from text to graphics, you have a responsibility to make sure your graphics work well. If you add voice characters, you have a responsibility to make sure the voice characterizations you know, meet, meet the character, the, the player's expectations, the, the customer's expectations. Um, as far as, you know, uh, what that person or creature sounds like. Um, so, yeah, the more you try to control, the more responsibility you have with that control, and it be can become overwhelming. All right, so one last question then about Scepter. This is from Alan. Sure. Is there a couple elements of modern MMORPGs that you are really happy with or never imagined they could be like, and a couple elements that you valued back in the day that have been lost in modern games? It's a good question. Um, my modern game experience is limited pretty much to the Morrowind series um, and, and, and some Halo, <laughs> yeah. Um, my, I picked up a copy of Red Guard for my kids when it came out a million years ago and we've been kind of been tracking it ever since now that they're adults. Um, you know, I've, I've played Halo and I've played uh, the Morrowind series and, and some of uh, Mass Effect, but not a lot. I'm no Richard Bartle. I don't I don't play every game that comes out. Um, and uh, you know, I think that probably the biggest uh, difference is the global scale. Uh, when we were doing Gamebit, we were a community. We we're a Twin Cities community. We could have parties with the users, and the users could all get together. And it's a lot harder to be a jerk to someone who you've met and had a pizza with. Um, now that we're global and now that there are so many bots, you know, you encounter somebody on the Internet in a game. Are they a human? Are they from another country and they don't understand what you're about to say to them? Um, or are they on a different time zone where you'll never see them again because it's incredibly late for them and early for you? Um, or are they someone down the street? You don't know. And uh, it makes it a little bit harder to build that community, I think. Uh, certainly, we had a, a, a fun community here while it lasted. Yeah, I was just thinking about that with, the, with these franchises. It's very conceivable. You could just have a... And you did have several of these conventions and mm -hmm. meetups and things. And yeah, I, guess, I wouldn't go to so far as conventions, but we, we did have parties. Uh, yeah, WoW has, has their big WoW Con, I think they call it, but that just wouldn't yep. be the same as... You know what you're talking about. Well, it was fun because we uh, we went to we, our family went to Germany for a month in 2006. We did a home swap with a family in Nuremberg, and uh, one of the ways we kept the boys who were very young at the time in line was we promised them that if they behaved themselves, we would go to the video game conference in uh, Leipzig uh, that year. And so we went to that, and it was enormous—180,000 people. Wow. And um, what I didn't know at the time, what I found out later, and I really feel bad about, is that uh, the guy who, I uh, want to, not EverQuest, was it EverQuest? Might have been EverQuest, I can't recall, it's, it says it in my, in my article, but the guy who created this one big video game that my son played like crazy, um, 
was a former franchisee. Oh, was that Mark, uh, Mark Jacobs? It might have been Mark. It might, I don't think it was Mark Jacobs. No, it was uh, Mark. But Mark, Mark, I had a lot of discussion with when I was writing my paper. Um, but uh, yeah, it just was funny. I could I could have met him there. Um, as it was, that was my, where my son spent his entire time was at that one display. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it was, it was fun having that connection. One of my castmates in vilification tennis is, uh, Molly Glover, who works for fantasy flight games and is a producer for a number of the, uh, uh, games from, from fantasy flight. Oh yeah. I missed the first part of that. I remarking uh, on the game collection back there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you happen to have any of Molly's games back there. I know she did X wing. Um, Here's one you were talking about before. Yeah, Red Guard. There you go. Yeah, uh, I love these, the old game boxes that you can just uh, look at yeah. that. I mean, it's beautiful yeah, and, artwork on these things. And I had no idea what it was when I picked it up. I just, you know, grabbed it for the kids. X Wing. Uh, I'm sure there's a copy there somewhere. Yeah. Anything, anything from Fantasy Flight. There's a, there's a good chance Molly worked on it. <laughs> you know what I need is some kind of organizational system. Those are nice. I've heard of those. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's Wing Commander. I'd have to. I'd have to spend some time digging around. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a box copy of a, a Scepter? No, no. This software. Uh was not published that way. We just, we sent it to people on discs, but, uh, you know, we didn't have a box or anything. No posters? We, or... No, we had, we had an article, we had a, a, a classified ad in PC Magazine, and that's how we got our franchises, you know? Yeah, we were talking about BBSs a while ago. I was, remember my dad loved those computer shopper magazines. If you remember those? Yep. Huge. Yep. <laughs> like, it's like a buck for this thing. Yep. I was uh, I was adopted, and when I found my birth families uh, in 1993, um, I was working at the university on the help desk. And because of the help desk, I had all these catalogs next to me on the shelf. And I'm talking to my birth mother on the phone. She says, "Yeah, your your brother, your half brother, he works in computers too. He works on Amiga computers. In oh, fact, he's I got two of them right back there. Right? I used to have one as well." And she said he's got a game called Dino Wars, and I was just like, <laughs> I was just like, really? I grab it off the shelf, crack it open. Dino Wars. There's my half brother's name right there in the book. Oh, um, that's cool. Yeah, he does. Uh, he's doing programming for 3D printers these days. That's what he's doing. Marlin Firmware, I think it's called. From Dino cool. Wars to 3D printing. Sure. Yep, I can see that. Yeah. All right, Bob. Well, let's get into Gopher. <laughs> you know, I told I told the people on Facebook I'm talking to you know one of the one of the guys you know one of the Gopher crew. So there's all these anecdotes there about oh I use Gopher for this and this and a lot of fun. Yep. You know, it, it hits that nostalgia bubble I think for a lot of yep a lot of people. But you know, other people don't even know what the heck it is. Right. You know, so maybe we could just start there with like what what is it. Well, Gopher was the first time that data sub, subjective data, data by subject, was abstracted away from its underlying physical location. Um, and that's, that's the big difference. Um, prior to Gopher, if you wanted to find something on the Internet, you had to know where it was. Uh, somebody had to tell you, I've got a computer that's got this research on it. Here's my IP address because DNS wasn't even completely established yet at that point. Um, and then you could FTP into that IP address and you could pull their data down. But if you didn't know that person and didn't know about that, that information, you could not find it. Uh, there were some preliminary uh, search tools that were being built. I think Archie was one of them uh, that was starting to browse FTP sites and build indexes. But if you didn't know where that was, you couldn't find it. Uh, Gopher was the first time that you could not know where something was and say, I want to know about, um, I want to know about cars. I would like to learn about cars and you type cars into a search engine 
and it takes you to a, a computer that has information about cars that you didn't know was there before. So prior to Gopher, you couldn't find things. Gopher was the first time you could browse the internet, um, and that's the big, the big difference, and that's why it was popular for as long as it was. Um, I mean, this sounds huge. I mean, the first time you could search the internet. Yeah, it 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 is it's a it was a fundamentally important step, uh, especially because the internet was still in that collaborative stage of development where you know we wrote Gopher and then gave it out to the internet, which made changes and gave it back, and it swirled around, and we had a lot of trouble versioning and and, and quality controlling, but everybody was writing Gopher. You know, everyone was was helping, um, and as a result, people were able to then work on things like the World Wide Web. They were able to work on um, uh, Berners-Lee's software, uh, in part because they could find other people who were working on that software and collaborate on that software. So when I say that like Gopher was a bridge to the web, um, that's kind of what I mean. Without Gopher, uh, certainly the pool of people who could have contributed to the web's development would have been considerably smaller. Uh, it might have come out looking a lot different than it did. Um, but yeah, that was a, a very important thing. The other phenomenon that happened with that was that librarians got involved because prior to Gopher, yeah, the people that commented on my story were librarians. Librarians were prior to Gopher the the gatekeepers of data and information. You know, the one way you could find something on the internet. <clears throat> prior to Gopher is you could call a research librarian and say, I'm interested in cars. Who's doing work on cars? And they could say, they could do a literature search and come back to you and say, well, Fred Smith at UCLA, why don't you contact him? That would be a way you could find something. So when Gopher came along, librarians became very concerned about data classification, tracking, and management, basically information science. And that that was part of what I think led to some of the problems for Gopher is that we ended up trying to respond to that and incorporate it into Gopher itself. And as you can see by the mess that's become of information science on the Internet today, that really wasn't the direction the Internet was going. You know, the inter in Internet was going in the direction of, no, nah, it's all just in one big pool, just throw in a few search terms and hashtags and hopefully you'll come up with it. Um, whereas the you know, the librarians would have much rather that every piece of data placed on the Internet had meta, meta tags all over it saying what it was and to what it applies. But clearly that's not what we do. <clears throat> so there was a lot of time invested in, in sort of trying to incorporate li library sciences into the data management of Gopher. You know, just looking at some of the early, some of the stuff you could find on Gopher. Mm -hmm. Campus newspapers. Mm hmm weather i mean we just take that for granted but i mean being right. able to find out what's the weather like in seattle right now i mean that sure you could use gopher for that <laughs> well, recipes we had a, and research tools we had a funny thing we were a part of a service called collective contents and what this was was that um a a research publisher in pennsylvania i think uh would uh collect together every week all of the new research articles that were published in that period and they would post the abstracts uh, and the way they would do that is they would put them on tape and then they would mail the tape to different colleges and we would get the tape in and then using indexing tools we would index that into gopher so now you could search the week's most recent um, articles and at one point I contacted the publisher and I said Instead of sending tape, could you just put it on, an, on, a, on a gopher site so that I can just draw the file over the Internet? And they were irritated and annoyed, but they, they added that step to the process. And so we continued receiving the tapes, which we then just threw away because we were getting <laughs> the data over the Internet. But the publisher couldn't change their paradigm enough to stop sending us the tapes. Uh, yeah, I was, that's, some of the, this, the article gets into some of these I guess uh, kerfuffles, I suppose, that you got into with some of these old old paradigms at the universities. And it was a funny story about a lady that just freaked out 
you know, when you wanted to uh, go from the, was it go from the mainframe to the, oh, yeah. uh, to the max? I mean, <laughs> no, <laughs> it seems funny in retrospect, but I mean, it was this has to do with with collegiate bureaucracies? You know, they exist to perpetuate themselves. If you have a standing meeting on building a thing, you know, either you finish building the thing or that meeting goes on forever. Um, what we did with Gopher was that between two of these standing meetings of building a campus-wide information system, we just wrote Gopher in a month because my boss was tired of going to the meetings. Um, and when we debuted a working piece of software that completely ignored the requirements document that we had been assembling for three years, yes, one of, one of the people in the meeting jumped up and down shouting, you can't do that. Um, and formally speaking, she was right, but we did anyway. Yeah, I've run into that problem several times. <laughs> How little things have changed. <laughs> yep. Uh, but this is kind of cool that I know we have some Mac fans who watch this show, so they might want to know about the Macs that were being used, the uh, SE30, I believe. Mm-hmm. Well, we had, a, we had the Mac 2. The Mother Gopher, I think it was. The, the yeah, the uh, 2X, possibly. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was all running on Mac equipment at the time. We we had Macs, and then we, we, we went off into Next computers, if you remember those. Oh, yeah. Steve Jobs was exiled from Mac for a little while, so he decided to prove that, you know, it was him and not the, and not Mac. And uh, he developed the Next. And, of course, like the Amiga, the Next had uh, the thing that we've come to take for granted, at least Mac users have, which is the... Um, the GUI operating system on top of a command line operating system. And that was something that I appreciated about the Amiga <clears throat> was that, um, you know, it's fun to be able to drag folders around on your screen and double click things to open them up. But sometimes you want to, you know, get in there and type out a command line that specifically and exactly mm -hmm. says what you want to do. Um, and next was one of the first computers to really get that right. Amiga was as well. Um, but then the next went on to become the OS X that we know today. So the CLI and the shell mm -hmm. workbench. Yep. I remember all that stuff. Uh, so the gopher, well, I guess not the gopher, but the gopher, this thing is really taking off in ways that are really not dissimilar. I think it was compared to a rock star. Oh yeah. Well, you know, phenomenon. We got... I mean, I, Al Gore wasn't in, gotten into it or you had, Heck, I don't even. I think it was. I think I think I saw a clip from MTV, something on there yep. where it was. Uh, <laughs> yep. um, the thing well, was huge. This is like in the early '90s, basically. Right. Adam Curry was uh, one of the DJ, VJs on MTV, and he set up an MTV go, Gopher server. Contacted him and said, "You know, it says in the license that if you're using this for commercial purposes, you should get a license." And he said, "Oh crap. Okay. Uh, how much does that cost?" And my boss. Mark McHale said, wear one of our T-shirts on the air, and that'll be the fee. And so we've got scratchy old uh, MTV footage of Adam Curry wearing a gopher T-shirt on MTV um, in, in order to fulfill the licensing agreement. That's cool. Yeah, you were running into some of the same problems that you had before, sounded like, with gopher and well, and the this idea of commercializing somehow being a bad thing. It, well, and it was, and and in fact, the culture at the time, okay, you have to get this in your head. Imagine you're, it's 1992, and you're doing stuff on computers, and whenever you see a .com domain name, that looks crass. That looks tacky. That looks like, what are you doing? Because at the time, what you would see were .edus and .mills, and that's because the Internet was still a product of the U.S. government and was used largely by educational institutions in the military. And dot .com were basically people who were trying to exploit this publicly funded internet for their own purposes. It's like if they decided to start selling books in a library. You know, it's just like, mm, really, you know? Hmm. Um, and it wasn't until uh, the internet was, was uh, moved off of DARPA in 94 that it became sort of culturally understood that now people are going to use this for commercial business. Um, at the same time, it's a collaborative environment. Everybody is helping write Gopher. I mean, we had so much help from the University of Michigan and people you know, around the Internet. 
um, in, in making bug fixes and feature enhancements and, and stuff like that. Um, and then all of a sudden we just announced, well, we're going to start making money now. You know, and these people have legitimate beef to say, didn't I just spend several nights working on that? Why am I not getting any of this money? Um, but the reason that we needed to start asking for money is because, and this is an important thing for people to understand, writing Internet Gopher was never our jobs. Um, our jobs were to be uh, university campus help desk workers. We were not supposed to be software developers. And so we were still doing 40 hours a week of help desk and then writing Internet Gopher on our spare time. Um, meanwhile, the university is gaining great prestige for being the home for Internet Gopher. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we're being expected to maintain it while not being paid to maintain it. Um, and that was an increasing burden. So when our boss's boss decided to license the idea was that we could get some of that money in order to hire more people, in order that we could become dedicated gopher coders. Um, but culturally, the, universe, the, the Internet was not ready for that yet. Um, and so we got to be the people who, who uh, you know, took it on the chin for, for trying to go commercial. You know, a year later, everybody's going commercial. Everything's commercial. But at that point, it hadn't that, that dam hadn't broken yet. So well, you did get a cool T-shirt, though. <laughs> yeah, we got some cool T-shirts. Yeah, Bob's got a shirt on. Oh, sure. Yes. I'm gonna look at this. I created the world's first massively multiplayer online role-playing game, MMORPG Company, and all I got was this lousy shirt. I think so we could also I... add Gopher to this too. Do you have a shirt like that for that's, Gopher? That's this shirt. I invented the internet and all I got was this lousy shirt. <laughs> what is it? Oh, it's a box. I really did. Check out the internet gopher protocol precursor to the World Wide Web. I was on the team. You're welcome. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> My spouse made both of these for me. Do you sell those shirts somewhere? Probably not uh, since you you don't want other people claiming that <laughs> they're the... You <laughs> should make one that says Bob. Right, know. exactly. Here's your next uh, idea. And so one of the questions people might be wondering if they don't know much about gophers, like, okay, uh, you know, why aren't we using gopher today? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, why are we using the uh, the web? And I saw a quote from you I thought was so good. I think this is you. Uh, so you were talking about the, let's see, 1994, modem speeds doubled, rendering of images. Oh, yeah, the in images. The rendering of images on the web greatly accelerated. PCs began to be sold with these faster modems built in. To anyone looking for a simple, even crude explanation for the web's rise, this is it. The ability to view a reasonable facsimile of a naked woman in the privacy of your own home. That's what it came to drive a lot of the internet, Alberti says. Porn. Mm. Yep. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, I mean... Back in the late 80s, I was on the mailing list for the JPEG uh, compression uh, group that was working on building JPEG um, as a standard. And more than half of the discussion was about terracing effects on skin tones. You know, just if you don't handle terracing and the shift in, sh in shades enough, then something with multiple shades to it looks like rings, looks like, you know, it has rings, and they called it the terracing effect. Um, that was all about, you know, skin tone rendering. Now, yes, that's important in faces, but it's also important when you try to scan a centerfold and send it to somebody. Um, prior to that, there used to be something called radio teletype imagery, which is where you would get a, a text teletype to type over itself multiple times in multiple ways to produce a shaded image. And inevitably, those were pictures of naked girls. Um, so, you know, this was a consistent thread throughout the development of the Internet, was that moving around pictures of naked ladies was really important. And, um, yeah. In fact, I, I knew the guy who uh, locally, he poached the penthouse.com domain name and sat on it for like 10 years until they paid him a fortune for it. And that's why Penthouse Magazine was at Penthouse dash mag.com for the 90s and then he finally got his six-figure payment for poaching that domain wow. you know and uh, uh now they're at a more simple domain name um but yeah the, the 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 
ability to move images around quickly, whether or not they were naked ladies, uh, was certainly a deciding factor in, in the web's rise. So that really so, is true, that the porn industry drove that. I've heard the same thing about VCRs. Well, and I wouldn't say the porn industry drove it because it wasn't commercial interests that were driving the developments of these things, but it was individual coders who were willing to devote time to improving the web in these ways and what their motivations might have been. One can only speculate, but there was sure a lot of uh, uh, naked imagery going around. Well, then we had the, coming back to Murphy's Law again, I suppose, mm -hmm. Gopher's demise getting caught up in a criminal behaviors with an embezzled, embezzlement, tax evasion at the university. Well, that was, uh, was that Nigerian? Yes. That, that situation? Yes, that was. How does he <laughs> come into the picture? What, what does he have to do with anything? Um. Well, uh, that little sideline was because I was, I was helping a, a doctor out um, with his own home computer stuff while I was also working at the university. Um, and then Najarian was a doctor at the university who was also being paid on the side to consult to the university. And the university discovered him double dipping and they said, nope, you can't do that anymore. And so as a result, the doctor I was working for ended up stiffing me on my payments Mm -hmm. Um, so I never got paid for about a thousand dollars for the work I did back then. And then that guy went on, that doctor went on to start, um, a, a local cancer center, which was then shut down years later because he was a complete fraud. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of fraud going on. It's depressing. Oh, yes. Well, one last thing about, about Gopher. About Gopher. Mm -hmm. you know, about, uh, if if it hadn't ended like that and it had been successful, you know, over mm -hmm. the long term, how do you think the internet would look like today? Um. Well, Gopher was always going to be challenged moving from its original format to hypertext, which is what the web is. Um, I don't know that it, the internet would look any different than it does look today. Uh, you might just be using an extended gopher protocol that includes some means of implementing layout and, and images and, and stuff. Um, it's not really a bad thing that gopher had its time and went because gopher filled in a, a particular ecological niche on the internet. Um, and that niche has closed up and gopher is mostly extinct, but you know, it was, it was there, you know, where we could be using gopher today or in the future is in any application where the last communication link out to the client is the bottleneck. And what I mean by that is if you remember the early nineties or the mid nineties, they started to come out with cell phones that had web browsers on them. And those web browsers were usually horribly mangled implementations of the web protocol with all sorts of features just ripped out to make it work at all. And so you'd go on your phone's web browser and you'd get a, a, a crummy text sort of view of a Yahoo page or, or whatever was contemporary at the time without images and, and laid out in a very dumb way. Well, what they were doing was they were reverse engineering the web back into Gopher because that, that pipe down to the cell phone was, was the bottleneck. There was this little this little swizzle stick of communications uh, bandwidth to your phone and your phone itself was not capable of displaying the graphics and stuff. So when your last step is this tiny little limited thing, they could have just implemented gopher on those phones and those phones would have worked much better uh, rather than bastardizing the web protocol to do the same thing. Um, we could keep that in mind as we build communications for uh, sending data to other planets Let's pretend that there were people living on Mars, colonizing Mars, and they wanted to get news from Earth. Uh, it's going to be a really tight uh, protocol. It's going to be a really tight uh, communications bandwidth. Um, they're going to find that Gopher works pretty well for that. They'll be able to get text versions of what they need on a very limited bandwidth without a lot of bells and whistles stuffed down the pipe to them. 
Um, and if they want to get a picture to explain one of the articles, they can select it individually and look at that picture when it arrives. Um, so anytime your last leg of your, of your transmission is the bottleneck, Gopher could actually be a solution. But most people aren't aware of it to think of it. Well, that's pretty cool. It might end up on Mars one day. <laughs> I, it, it, it wouldn't surprise me because it would work well um, for very restricted data communications of that nature. All right, Bob. Well, thanks a lot for chatting with me. I want to get, a, before we go, a little bit into your uh, your book that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm not quite sure about some of the pronunciations on this, but M -A -R, Professor M.A.R. Barker's uh, Tecumel, right. your book, Mitlanyol. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, this first time I've heard about this role-playing system, but I, I was reading about the, reading about it, and apparently religion uh, plays a big role. Right. So the world of Tecumel um, was published in 1975 as the world as the first um, role-playing setting following the publications of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, Professor Barker was uh, the chair of the um, university's wargaming group, and um, he was the academic sponsor. And so he knew Gygax and Arneson because they would come to the university to play war games. And they knew that he had this world he had developed. Barker started working on Tecumel when he was like a child, like single digits in age. And we've found like comic strips that he's drawn. Um, wow. uh, when I say we, uh, I'm the past treasurer of the Tecumel Foundation, which was set up to manage his intellectual property after Professor Barker passed, passed on. And among his papers, we found comic strips he drew when he was a child that have character names that persist to this day in the novels. So he worked on that game his entire life, that world. And so when Arneson and Gygax were looking for a setting for Dungeons and Dragons, because if you think about it, D&D &D doesn't have a setting. It has rules, but it doesn't say where it takes place. Um, they turned to Barker because they knew he had a fully fleshed out world. Um, and so Empire of the Petal Throne was published in 75. Um, it was never terribly popular because it's based on uh, Southeast Asian and uh, Central American mythology rather than Western Europe mythology. And so it, it has not been as popular as games based on dragons and castles. Um, and it's a theoc it, it starts with a theocracy. The, the nation in which the game is set is called Solyanu. And um, it's a theocracy, which means that the ten gods and the ten gods' cohorts, um, somebody has to worship, you have to worship one of them. There's no atheists on this planet. And part of the reason that there's no atheists on this planet is because these gods that will actually show up and slap you across the face if you say, I don't believe in the gods. Um, they're, they're, whether they're gods or just big interdimensional beings is not quite clear, but the fact is they demand worship and they're real, and if you try to be an atheist, they'll convince you otherwise. Um, so everyone in, who plays Tecumel has to decide what god they worship. And most everybody would say, ah... You got 20 gods? Um, I don't know. Is there a god of swords? And they'd say, yeah, it's Vimukla. He's the god of warriors. Okay, fine. I worship him. And everybody's just worshiping Vimukla, and there's like 19 other gods sitting around. Um, so I worked with Professor Barker across about 12 years' time to build an encyclopedia of the religions of Tecumel, the gods, and their philosophies so that a player can pick up Mitlanyal as a new player and look through it pretty quickly and go, oh, here, uh, here's Avante, the goddess of crops and cycles of nature. I like Avante. That sounds cool. I'll be an Avante worshiper. Um, so, you know, that was, that was the idea behind that. I gamed with Professor Barker from about 87 to about 2009. So. Well, I noticed the books were are selling. You know, I'm trying to get a sense of, I mean, is it, is this a pretty popular setting these days? Well, or? it, uh, Tecumel has always had a small following. You can go to tecumel.com to learn more about it, T-E-K-U-M-E-L.com. Um, it's, it's always had a small and, and fairly dedicated following. Um, it, the books sell all right. They're available on drivethroughrpg.com. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you can get into Tecumel and, and, and buy some up-to-date stuff. And then there's always, been, um, there's always been a version of Tecumel rules available Every decade since it was published, um, there was, you know, Empire of the Petal Throne, and then in the 80s there was Swords and Glory, 
And then the 90s, there was Guardians of, of, of Order or whatever they were called. I can't recall. Um, nowadays, uh, Jeff D., uh, who was originally involved in some of the Dungeons and Dragons stuff, he's published a game book called Baythorm, uh, which is a, a set of rules for Tecumel. Uh Baythorm is a Tsuliani word, which means pocket dimension, which is where Tecumel is. It's in its own little dimension by itself. There are no other stars in the sky. There is just one solar system. Um, and so if you want to play contemporary Tecumel, you can pick up a copy of Jeff, Jeff D.'s Baythorm and go to it. It's just, I mean, it's, it sounds like it's quite a bit different than, say, 5e rules. Or... It's it's very, very different. Um, the the rules themselves are not so different. Jeff is a, is a, is a well-respected rules author, and he's written rules that are sort of the type of rules you expect out of games these days. Um, and uh, But the world itself is very different. It's a, it's a pantheon. Um, individuality is, is frowned upon in this culture. Um, you know, the, the idea of a stalwart hero who goes off to slay dragons, not quite what you do in Tecumel. You need to be actually doing a lot more role playing because uh, the only people who should be dra- who should be slaying dragons in Tecumel are people from the dragon slaying clans. And if you're not from the dragon slaying clans, you have no business muscling in on their thing. So um, if you want to be a dragon slayer, make sure your character is part of a dragon slaying clan before you start playing the game. Um, there's, it, it, since it's based on Southeast Asia and, and Central America, um, it's, it's much more built on, on social hierarchy, on clan obligation, um, and on establish, per, fulfilling your place in the, social, uh, in the social network that you're expected to fill. So it's it's very different mindset for people playing the game. It's enormously fun. I played it for 22 years, um, but you do have to put your brain into a different place. But then, isn't that what gaming is all about anyway? Exactly. Did you make a version of this, uh, a computerized version? Mm, I don't believe there's ever been a computerized version of TechML. I think people have tried to do MUDs for TechML. Oh yeah, uh, that's what it was. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, those have. You know, over the years, people have, have tried in fits and starts, but they've never really gotten very far. Sounds like there's some untapped potential there. For Oh, yeah, I'd love to play it. Do you think it's real... just resistant to the format, or is it just somebody's just done it? Yet? I, think it's the, I think it's the lack of audience. Um, Tecumel is enough of a niche game that we never really had a large number of qualified mud designers who could also call themselves fans. Um, and so... You know, those of us who po- who po- poked around with it a little bit never really got very far. So. No, well, Bob, again, thanks for the chat. Is there anything that we wanted to cover that we didn't get to? Uh, no, it's uh, been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. And uh, people can message me at uh, Albatross on Twitter. I'm uh, at sign Albatross. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to follow up. I think your show is uh, coming up. Our show is coming up uh, on the 25th of September. Um, I don't know when your your recordings get posted, but it may have already occurred. Uh, we have show. Okay. Well, we have shows every month, and Velification Tennis also has a YouTube channel where you can find recorded shows that we've done online. So you can uh, go back and and just look at some of our recordings and, and catch some of our comedy there. Most excellent. Thanks again. Yep, my pleasure. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back quite soon, and I will have a special returning guest, none other than Mr. Brian Fargo, who will once again grace the stage of the Matt Chat Arena, and he will be joined by David Rogers, the system designer of Wasteland 3. Now, so if you've got questions about Wasteland uh, 3 or, I guess, anything else for Brian, we can't get into uh, speculations about Fallout. And so I'll just cut those off there, unfortunately. Uh, but anything else you want to know, pass them on. Uh, you can leave a comment or get on the Twitters and the Facebooks and all that. And I'll try my best to uh, collect all those and, you know, we'll run them by uh, Brian and see what we, what we can get to. But I think you'll uh, really enjoy that, so stay tuned. Also, I want to say a special shout out here to Fandazi, or Fandazi Fire, 
And the reason I'm mentioning them is, well, they're really cool. Uh, fire performance at the uh, Minnesota Renaissance Festival. Uh, it was specifically Teresa and uh, her husband, Chris. They are part of this. They're also our, Chris is our dungeon master. And Teresa is one of the players. Uh, but anyway, Teresa knows about match hats. And when she was talking to Bob, who's, as you learned from the video, is also a uh, performer there, I guess the subject came up and uh, she helped me uh, connect with him and get him on the show. Uh, so I just wanted to say a special shout out to her. And I think it's really cool what, what they do at uh, FandaziFire.com. So, so go check that out. And uh, thanks again, Teresa. Uh, also, of course, I want to thank you very, very, very much for your support of the show keeping match. What is it, like 400 something, 57? <laughs> you know, we're not too far from 500 episodes of Match Chat here. And, and that's entirely because of you and your support. I mean, you are completely awesome. Uh, if you want to, uh, you know, continue this, you know, help me get to the 500, maybe we'll get to 1,000 one day. Who knows? Uh, but you can do that. Just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon page. All I ask from you guys is a dollar per show. It really means a lot to me for you to do that. Uh, you know, times are still tough. I understand that. But, you know, if you are okay financially, please go over there and support the show. I'd be... Uh, you know, I'll be eternally grateful to you for that uh, support. Uh, also, telling people about the show. Uh, <laughs> you could be like, Teresa, help me uh, find a guest for the show. That's, that's even, uh, you know, that's really awesome. Uh, but just tweeting, comment, even just like liking the video, whatever it is you do to support the show, I just want you to know I appreciate it and thank you. Okay. <laughs> what about that news from the Mint? So much news, you know, I could go on for like another couple hours with this, but uh, I, I narrowed it down to three, tried to give you a little bit of everything. Uh, the first one was sent in by Helmy, J-A-U-M-E. I think I got his pronunciation right. Probably didn't, but I went to one of those like pronounced names dot site and it told me his name was Helmy. So <laughs> uh, maybe I got it right. Uh, Helmy, let me know. Uh, anyway, this is totally awesome. So you remember there's a game, you remember the game Elite? I've got a copy of the sucker right there. One of my favorite games from back in the day. Uh, I didn't play it on the original machine. It was uh, the BBC Micro, I suppose. Uh, I played it on the Commodore 64. Uh, but anyway, what has happened is they released the source code for it, but given the memory restrictions of the game, uh, the code was very uh, abbreviated, shall we say. Basically, you couldn't make much of it unless you're some kind of super genius. Uh, so what Mark Moxon or Moxon has done is take this code, and he's got the full story on the website. You can read about this, but he's gone through like three or four different sets of uh, comments, and what has resulted is something. <laughs> the result of all this is code you can actually read and figure out what was so cool about the uh, uh, the elite uh, uh, source code all of these comments in it to explain what's going on. So I'll just read what he's got here. Uh, this site and its accompanying repository are the results of that study I was telling you about. Uh, <clears throat> the aim is that anyone with a basic knowledge of 6502 assembly language and simple trigonometry will be able to read through the source code and not only understand it, but also appreciate the beauty and the elegance of this exceptional piece of 1980s programming. Uh, so it's probably a little bit above my uh, pay grade. You know, I don't even have a basic understanding of 6502 uh, assembly language. But I, I really appreciate what Mark has done. And I know some of you guys are probably, you know, will be all over that. Uh, so I'll post a link in the show notes. And, you know, thank you to uh, Helme for that. Of course, also uh, to Mark uh, for putting that together. Pretty awesome stuff. Uh, moving on. Uh, the, probably the other big item is Microsoft just snatching up everything you know there's just like the borg out there assimilating every game studio on the planet <laughs> uh they uh, have assimilated bethesda apparently now, i'm being a little facetious here of course uh, some people think it's uh it's good to get bought by microsoft you know it's not as they're not the evil uh not like the certain evil uh software publisher from back in the day that has <laughs> kind of bought these uh, studios up to basically destroy them uh, but you know i'd like to hear your opinion on this 
I got a, I mean, the internet's just full. I mean, they even were talking about this on NPR, for God's sake. I mean, everybody seems to know about this and have an opinion on it. But anyway, I didn't realize how many other studios they had picked up. I guess I'd heard this off and on, but just, you know, here's the list. So Microsoft has acquired, of course, Bethesda, Obsidian, uh, Double Fine, and Exile. <laughs> Speaking of Brian Fargo. Uh, Ninja Theory. And that's just apparently just a sort of the uh, <clears throat> tip of the iceberg here. they got a bunch of other studios. So anyway, some folks are really excited about this. Uh, some are very cynical. You know, there's a, this article I'm going to post here. It goes into some questions about, uh, you know, what people are asking about the um, this acquisition what might happen in the long run i thought it was a a pretty good take on it uh, but i wanted to uh, mention this basically what i want is for you to tell me what you think about it <laughs> you know again I've, I've been so busy i haven't really even had the uh, the brain power to process this yet but you know do you think are you uh you know do you think this is a good thing i saw some speculations that this might result in uh, some kind of streaming service taking over for PC games. You know, there's there's a lot of uh, peripheral issues around all this, but it's pretty big news. So I'd like to get your take on it. And then uh, finally, we have a game called Wagadu, uh, the Wagadu Chronicles. This is on Kickstarter. It is a an Afro-fantasy MMO with a focus on role-playing. So in a lot of games, they say that now, you know, we put the role back in role-playing and all this. Uh, but definitely take a look at this one, because I, I really think they're going, uh, they're really taking that seriously. It is a pretty interesting things. Uh, this game is from Berlin, Germany. And they say it's the first time in gaming history where the, we're building an online game 100% tailored to role players. Uh, from the lore all the way through uh, the mechanics. Uh, so I'll let you look at the video on your own. You can read these in the comments. But, you know, this is a criticism I hear all the time. You know, even though like World of Warcraft has those role-playing servers, if you want to try some, uh, you know, in-character stuff, it's, it's never really seemed to uh, get the, you know, something, I guess it just, they never quite succeeded in that, you know, so uh, some people uh, have said, you know, they, this is what they would really like to play, you know, something with more role-playing. So check this out. Plus, I, I think it's kind of cool that they're going with this Afro-fantasy theme, you know, if you're, if you're tired of, like, the standard um, sword and sorcery stuff, you, you might really enjoy this uh, setting. So definitely go check that out. I'm pretty sure they've already made their goal. But, you know, of course, you might want to get in on the uh, the Kickstarter anyway to get some cool backer rewards. Uh, so let's wrap it up with a quote. And uh, the quote this uh, for this episode comes from Bob Alberti. At least uh, Bob is the one who recommended it. You know, it's always cool when I have guests on that actually, like, watch the show, <laughs> know the format, and, you know, like, suggest quotes and stuff. It's really cool. You know, go, go, going that extra mile uh, as a guest. Uh, but anyway, here's the quote. It's from uh, Lewis Carroll's The Three Voices. It goes something like this. The good and great must ever shun that reckless and abandoned one who stoops to perpetrate a pun. Ponder on that and see you guys next time. to chew bubblegum and kick ass, and I'm all out of ass. <laughs> <laughs>